Our scripture this morning, we have two passages from uh, the Gospels, one from the Gospel of John, the other from Matthew. And before we read, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word which you give to us. We pray that we would hold it dear and close to our hearts, and that it would always point to your word incarnate, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Help us to understand your word by the power of your spirit. And by the power of your spirit, help us to be doers as well as hearers. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first reading will come from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. So, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. I have a, a little reading here. I'm sure you, many of you maybe have heard it before. Uh, but bear with me if you have. It's called Ten Little Christians. Ten Little Christians Standing in a Line one disliked the preacher, and then there were nine. <laughs> nine little Christians stayed up late. One slept in on Sunday, and then there were eight. Eight little Christians on their way to heaven. One took their own road, and then there were seven. Seven little Christians chirping like chicks. One disliked the music, and then there were six. Six little Christians seemed very much alive, but one lost interest, and then there were five. Five little Christians pulling for heaven's shore, but one stopped to rest, and then there were four. Four little Christians, busy as a bee, one got their feelings hurt, and then there were three. Three little Christians knew not what to do, one couldn't forgive another, and then there were two. Two little Christians, our round was nearly done, quarreled over petty stuff, and then there was only one. One little Christian can't do much, tis true, brought their friend to Bible study, though, and then there were two. Two earnest Christians each brought one more. That doubled the number, and then there were four. Four sincere Christians worked early and worked late. Each brought another, and then there were eight. Eight splendid Christians, if they doubled as before, in just a few short weeks, would have 1,024. <laughs> so that's uh, something to remember, a good point. And I'll get to that <coughs> soon here. But first, I'll tell you about a, a gentleman uh, named Jim who had a heart for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. He especially wanted to help spread the gospel uh, to those who really hadn't had a chance to hear it, to those that others had forgotten about or ignored or thought were too much trouble to try to spread the gospel to. But he knew it was going to be difficult because the circles that Jim had grown up in and that he lived in were a huge jump from these groups of folks that he wanted to go and share the gospel with, who had touched his heart. And so he realized that he would have to make some changes in his life in order to reach them. And so in order to fit in a little better, he shaved his head, except he had one long ponytail and he dyed a different color, gave up the clothes he was comfortable with and wear clothes that uh, were more like those he cared for. He learned the street language that they spoke so that he might communicate a little better with them. And eventually he ended up moving to their neighborhood so that he could live life with them. He wanted to show them uh, that he was one of them. He didn't want to talk to them as if he was talking down to them because he wasn't. He wanted to show them the, the love of Jesus Christ. And all this was hard enough in itself to make these changes. Uh, but even more difficult was that he still yet had to spend a great many 
lonely and weary hours, discouraged because at first he still wasn't accepted. He really kind of had to prove himself to these people that he really loved them. And there were a great many things that they did that he could not do because it conflicted with his beliefs. And so, you know, he was often ostracized because of that. But still yet, he continued on loving and living among them and relying on the Holy Spirit to make a way. And you might ask yourself, did any of this come to anything? Uh, you might ask the hundreds of thousands of Chinese Christians whose lives were touched directly and indirectly by Jim's ministry. Jim is better known as James Hudson Taylor, who was the founder of the China Inland Ministry about a century ago. A man who went, and despite all the hardships, never gave up. And slowly but surely began to touch the lives of those who were around him when they saw that he wasn't speaking down to them, he wasn't playing games with them, he was there for the long haul with them, and that he loved them. Uh, he began the church in China as we know it today. Hundreds of thousands of folks from that one heart that cared. Hudson's heart was set about caring about the same things that Jesus cared for. I guess I should say probably rather cared for who Jesus <coughs> cared for. Because Jesus cares for the hearts and lives of people that he loves. And those are hearts that cry out for Jesus, even when sometimes they don't know what their heart is crying out for. You know, sometimes people's hearts cry out for the Lord, and they don't know what it is, and so they try to fill it with everything else in the world, whether it be drugs or relationships or adventure or a good time or whatever else. But pretty soon all that runs out, and they're still left with that hole in their heart, wondering how to fill it. And they know that there has to be something better in this world than the world has shown them thus far. They know that there has to be a love that is unconditional, a love that will lift them up. Instead of the love that the world shows, which so often rejects you if you don't tow the world's line, they know that there has to be someone who will accept them just as they are, but who will not leave them as they are, who will love them and not tear them down, but transform them and build them up. They know there has to be a truer, clearer, more peaceful, <coughs> more joyful way of living than they have found so far in the world. And they want to know a love that will remain even as they challenge it, even as they push its boundaries and maybe even sometimes push its button to see if that love is all it claims to be. A love that won't leave them when times get hard, like so often love does in this world, but a love that will patiently pick them up when they fall down, dust them off, and set them on the path again, even if they have to start at square one over and over again. That's the type of love that Jesus offers. And that's the type of love that we are called to reach out with as well. Jesus in his ministry, if you remember, reached out that type of love and time and again was castigated by the religious authorities of his day because of the people that he ate with the people that he taught, the people that he reached out and touched, and the people that he allowed to reach out and touch him. As Christ's followers, we are called upon to be like Jesus himself, to have that same heart that he had for people. In the words that he spoke before he ascended into heaven, he called all of us to spread the good news of who he was and what he had done and what he would still do in the hearts and lives of those who would come to him to spread that news into all the world. Now you note when you read this passage, it's called the Great Commission, of course, that Jesus doesn't say only those who are qualified and feel they have the knowledge can do this because that would leave all of us out because none of us will feel qualified or feel we have the knowledge we need. And notice it doesn't say only those who've gone to seminary and are ordained as a minister are called to this ministry and mission doesn't say those words at all. It simply says all those who are his disciples are to go into all the world showing God's love to everyone around us. And that is not an easy thing to do, to open up our hearts and lives to people, and especially the deepest parts of our hearts and lives sometimes and our spiritual beliefs, with those who may be completely unlike us and with people who may at first uh, even mock and reject what we have to say. You know, we are normal people. We fear rejection. We fear failure. And we may fear as well that we may not represent the Lord 
very well. And we don't have the wherewithal to do it. And if we had to do it all on our own, that might actually be the case. But we are told that we don't have to do it all alone. We're told in the very passages that Jesus calls us to do this, that he will be with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. He tells us that we will not be alone in these things, but that he will breathe the power of the Holy Spirit into us so that we might be able to rely on God and on God's power and on his insight instead of relying only on our insight. And outwardly sometimes, this may seem to be a bit awkward. And it may seem as if we haven't made a dent in anything. But we don't know how God is working in the hearts and lives of people that we witness to by our words and the things we do. They may present a stone face, but we may have touched a heart. Or it may have planted a seed that will only grow much later. We don't know. I think I've told you the story before, but I'll tell it to you again about Charles Spurgeon, who was a really famous minister in Great Britain years and years ago, probably 100 years ago, um, and had one of the largest churches in London, was known as a very eloquent speaker. He got up one Sunday to speak and just kind of botched his sermon. He just couldn't quite get it out, and he was kind of ashamed that he even got up there and did it. But he had the greatest response to that sermon that he had of any of his other sermons. And he said he learned from that that it wasn't his eloquence that caused people to come to the Lord, but it was the Lord's Spirit. So it kind of humbled him to realize that. That it wasn't his goodness or greatness, it was the Lord working through him. It's the same with us. The Lord promises that he will give us the words to speak. And all we have to do is to do what the Lord calls us to do. And he will be the one to take care of it. We just have to go and do and share. And the Lord will be the one who actually works on the hearts. But in order to do this, it means we might have to ask ourselves some questions. We need to ask ourselves then, what are our priorities? Are our priorities in life the same as the Lord's priorities? When we look at other people, what do we see? Do we look with our own judgmental eyes? I know all too often I do. Or do we look with the eyes of the Lord? Seeing past someone's outward appearance, maybe even their reputation, and seeing the same heart that the Lord sees, that the war Lord wants to reach out and touch in love. An even bigger question may be, who do we see? And who do we not see, even as they walk right past us? I think if you're like me, you probably run in certain circles of people. That's just the way it is. You can't know everybody we all have groups of friends that we, that we hang around with and know and check on. And the circles of people that we're in are probably people who are a lot like us. You know, they may be people who go to church or connected to church some way. But in truth, there are whole groups of folks out there who are totally unlike us that we don't even know. Maybe not even only in passing. And they don't go to church. And they don't run in the same social circles that we do. They don't have the same pastimes that we do. And so we will not come in contact with them in our regular day of life, maybe. They may even spend time in places and with people that we might be wary of. But we need to ask ourselves the question, how does the good news of Jesus Christ get to those folks? How will they hear about Jesus and about Christ's love for them if there's no one to go and tell them? You might say, well, there's somebody else for that. I wouldn't count on that. You can't count on somebody else doing it. If you do, you'll find out that everybody else counted on somebody else to do it. And nobody did it. Uh, nobody gets to do a lot of stuff. But uh, it should be each and every one of us looking at how we might be able to do this. And it may well be that we have been placed here just for the purpose of reaching certain people. There are certain people that we can reach that others can't. There are certain people that you can reach out to that I never could. And people maybe that I can reach out to that you can. You know, and, and so the Lord has put us here for a purpose. We're not here by mistake. But we need to synchronize our vision with Christ's vision in order that we might do that. And by doing that, we ask those questions. What are our priorities? How are we reaching out? to people who are we reaching out to, who do we see, who do we not see. <coughs> the truth is, and I, I read these statistics not too long ago, 
is that the church in America, and that's a church with a capital C, that means the church as a whole, is at a crossroads. In the United States, the church as a whole is no longer reaching out to people who don't go to church anywhere. Uh, and that's amazing because that is probably the largest and the largest growing group of people in America. Those who don't go anywhere aren't connected to anything. Most churches that are growing now grow not by reaching out to those folks, but by simply bringing in people who used to go to other churches. And that's okay in and of itself, because that happens. But we don't want to be like the, the old Cajun horse traders. I don't know if you've ever heard the story that Justin Wilson used to tell. You know that Justin Wilson used to be the Cajun cook on PBS. He told a story about a man that had a horse. And another man walked down and saw it and said, you know, I like that horse. How much are you selling to me for? And the man said, well, I'll sell you that horse for $400. And the man said, you got a deal. And he bought the horse. Well, the horse's original owner was walking down the road one day and passed the horse and went to the new owner and said, you know, I miss that horse. I'd like to have it back. How much you sell it to me for? So I sold that horse to you for $600. And the man said, well, you know, I'll buy that horse back. So he bought it back. And a couple weeks later, the other man walking by said, you know, I really do miss that horse. I'd like to buy him back from you. How much you want for him? So I'll take $800. <laughs> so paid him $800, took the horse. Well, the first man was walking down the road one time, and he saw the horse wasn't in the field. So he went to the man and said, what happened to that horse I sold you? He sold it. I sold it to a man passing through for $1,000. And the first man said, what are you doing? He said, we were both making a good living on that horse. <laughs> and so, you know, that's kind of the way we are. We keep trading horses back and forth, trading Christians back and forth. But how do we reach other types of folks? And that's not an easy question to answer. But it's an answer that we have to come to. And so we begin that by praying to the Lord. Prayer is our most overlooked uh, weapon in our spiritual warfare. Um, but we should begin by prayer. Praying and claiming the Lord's promise that He'll never leave us and forsake us. His promise that He'll fill us with the Holy Spirit. And then pray that he will give us a vision of those folks that we haven't seen, that we can look out for. And we pray that he will touch our lives and theirs, that we might meet together in the Lord. And that we might show love to those, maybe especially those that others have forgotten, don't see. We don't have to go as far as James Hudson Taylor, either geographically or in changing our lives in order to reach people around us. But the Lord may need to move us some in ways so that we can do and see what he calls us to and so that we can see more and care more about the things that he has concern with and we have to be willing to pray and then to see and accept the answers that he gives us that funny little poem i read about the ten little christians that's a bit simplistic but there's always a little truth to those things and it's true that if we focus on things we don't like or if we focus only on ourselves, <coughs> then our spiritual strength will begin to dwindle. But if we begin to focus on what the Lord's priorities are, if we begin to focus on His Word and on the hearts and lives of others, then the Lord will begin to strengthen us. And at that point, one can become two, and two, four, four, eight, and maybe eventually in the Lord's timing, 1,024. Who knows? That's anything's possible with the Lord. But only in the but the main thing we have to keep in mind and remember is that the Lord cares about each and every one of those 1,024 hearts individually as a person. And so should we. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your love that you have poured out upon us in such amazing ways. We have been such recipients of your mercy and grace and blessing. Help us now, Lord, in that to go out in joy and with peace in our hearts and share that good news with everyone around us. Open our eyes to see others that, that others don't see, that we can show your love to everyone we meet. And Lord, touch the hearts of those we'll come in contact with, that they'll be receptive of your love that we will show. Lord, help us to trust in you, realizing that we don't have to be perfect. All we have to do is what you call us to do and leave the rest up to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.